Hello, today I'd like to share with you my experiences of optimizing Kubernetes costs on AWS. I'm Andy, I'm Principal Platform Engineer at Flutter UK and Ireland, which is home to some of the best known brands in sports betting and gaming industry, including Betfair, Paddy Power, and where our story starts today, Skybet in Gaming, well, AKA Skybet. Skybet has been through several acquisitions in recent times. It's seen rapid growth of customers, people and technology, a side effect of that being an ever increasing cloud bill. And we've been working hard over the past few years to reduce that. Just to manage expectations today, I can't share with you any specific financial information. That's commercially sensitive. And the point of the talk today isn't really about what our cloud bill was or is, but the journey in between the two. Growth at Skybet has in part been powered by innovation. One such innovation was the introduction of the Kubernetes cluster back in 2016. At that time, tooling for building Kubernetes clusters was somewhat immature. And in the spirit of the Kelsey Hightower Kubernetes the hard way method, we built our own cluster and our own management tooling by hand. The how and the why is another talk. But let's just say there was no EKS, ECS or Fargate involved at that point. We run the clusters following the platform as a product paradigm. So it's a managed service which includes integration and automation for our developers and engineers, such as storage, load balancers, logging, monitoring, DNS certs, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And by 2019, it's become the de facto choice for new workloads. And indeed, many existing workloads have been migrated from the VM estate. A quick crash course in Kubernetes, for those of you that don't know how the resource management works. Kubernetes is a container orchestrator. Developers build their applications into containers following 12 factor principles. So small footprint, fast startup times, stateless, and resilient to restarts. And Kubernetes runs and manages those containers on a cluster of nodes. Those nodes, in our case, comprising of EC2 instances. And we have a tool called the Cluster Autoscaler, which allows our AWS clusters to expand when we have an increased amount of load and have more requirements for additional containers. And as it quiets off, it will then contract. Developers will declare or define the requirements for their containers in the manifest which they write. Typically, this is the requests and limits. Requests are the amount of guaranteed resource that a container will need. In this case, a quarter of a CPU and 64 megabytes of RAM, and the limit indicates the amount it will burst into. The request is super important because that will be reserved by the Kubernetes control plane for the container as it runs and will ring fence it. The more containers run, the more CPU requests, the more reservations are required, and the cluster will increase in size and contract when those requirements are no longer needed. Um, and getting these numbers right can be quite tricky, as we'll see. The workloads that run on the clusters are built by engineers in our engineering teams in other tribes and squads. Uh, and by 2019, tracking that ownership had become a little bit problematic. So we went through a piece of work where we recorded granular ownership information onto the workloads in the cluster in the form of metadata. Originally, this was going to be used for log shipping, uh, but it became useful for many other applications we'd not initially thought of. Following years of organic growth, this was a long and slow process, but certainly worthwhile and something you should do as a starting point. This enabled us in terms of cost management to create tooling which could record usage metrics against ownership, and therefore we could do cost attribution. Around the same time, the FinOps movement was gathering pace. In hindsight, we should have played more sense to it, but um, we did what we thought was right instead, doing it the hard way. Fortunately, there were some similarities between our own approach and the FinOps methods, either by coincidences or great minds thinking alike. But our methods and working practice has evolved in a very FinOps-like way. We initially wanted super accurate workload costs but we discovered quickly that perfection is the enemy of getting your cost reduced. In the end, we settled for something simple, something that was good enough. We identified the contended resource for our workloads. In our case, that was CPU request. So the reserved amount of CPU. That was causing the cluster to auto scale when busy. For you, that might be CPU, it might be memory, it might be storage, it might be network, it might be a combination of all four. But what we did is we simply divided the share of CPU reservation by the cost. When we compared the request and reservation on the cluster, we typically saw that the usage figure for workloads was way under that what was requested. In our example here, 
We have a blue line of usage at the bottom, a yellow line of request across the middle, and the gap between the two is resource we are paying for that we are not using. That is the gap, and we set about trying to reduce that. We initially produced some monthly reports showing a breakdown of costs for each of the workloads and showing those with the tribes, tracking that month to month. It didn't have quite the initial impact we'd hoped. We saw some teams were reducing the amount of request, but it wasn't having the massive effect on the gap which we were hoping for. We'd also hope that development teams would embrace more of the Kubernetes scaling techniques, such as using the horizontal pod auto scaler to allow workloads to scale based on demand. But that wasn't really on the team's roadmap. Fortunately, we found an ally. In the site reliability engineering team, in the BET tribe, uh, a bunch of engineers there were very uh, focused on performance, throughput, and response times. But it turns out the gap which we were seeing was a good indicator of an efficient workload. So they could raise tickets about optimization. They could even help the teams implement that optimization. The side effect of that is the gaps reduced. So certainly find an ally and help them to help you. We did look at some tooling. Here, thanks to our SRE friends, we've implemented Downscaler on our test cluster. And we can see at night, our workloads scale down as demand decreases, almost turning the lights off when you're not in the office. But what we also saw was teams schedule their requests based on anticipated workloads. One thing we discovered was availability and continuity of service is more important within reason than AWS cost. We've learned many lessons over the years, the impact of reputation, customer retention, and the effects on our call centers and social media teams can be huge if our services aren't available. So a couple of hundred quid for over requesting some resource can actually be money well spent. But this is what we really wanted to see. On the left here, a team is running with the, their expected amount of resource they require, when in fact they require a lot less. After optimizations and implementing the horizontal pod auto scaler, you can see now as the workload scales and the usage scales, so does the request, reducing the gap massively between the two. And this is what we were hoping for. We also did some work on the underlying EC2 infrastructure as well. Our cluster runs on EC2 instances, and we looked at all the possible cost saving opportunities there. We decided to go for dedicated hosts in the, in the end, so that we had a set of hosts reserved and run by our hosting team, which gave us a static amount of resource, a fixed cost available, and we could then burst into on-demand hosts when we got busy, as you can see from the graph here. Unfortunately, Kubernetes doesn't know the differences between on-demand and dedicated hosts, so we had to implement a custom scheduler to make sure that workloads were placed in preference on dedicated hosts and descheduled from on-demand hosts where possible, getting us those savings we were hoping for. We have learned many, many lessons during this process. The first one being that you can over-optimize. Don't reduce that request too much. Here we have a workload which has had its request drastically reduced, almost in line with its kind of background usage when it's not busy. However, when it's busy, it bursts into its limit, which in theory is a great way to manage your resource on Kubernetes. But that resource above the request is never guaranteed. So what we saw sometimes was that workload would get throttled because the resource was just not available for it because it wasn't guaranteed. Therefore, you can over-optimize. And sometimes the gap is okay. Here we have a workload which scaled up massively to 200 cores and then quickly scaled back. We approached the team that ran this workload and asked them if this was expected behavior and they said it was. At the slightest hint of traffic, this workload will scale up massively in preparation for a potential tens of thousands of customers interacting with one of our in-play services. If the traffic doesn't come, it then will immediately scale back down. This means that in-place services, which our customers rely on, are always there, even if uh, they are hit heavily all at once. We've already spoken about the reputational damage and the brand damage if services aren't available. And this spike here was roughly about $100, and therefore mitigating the risk against an essential service for in-play activity. 
Sometimes, though, there is no gap. Sometimes the costs go up, but it's not related to the constraint we found or we worked to. So here we can see that our costs went up. If we looked at the uh, CPU request across the cluster, it was flat. Something else was running the costs up. What we discovered is when we buried into the uh, cost allocation inside the Cost Explorer in AWS, we saw that network activity had gone up. So having done some analysis, we worked out what the workload was, discovered uh, an error in a test workload was causing a lot of network traffic. We made some optimizations to our underlying architecture about how applications and services in and out of the cluster communicate across AWS networking. Understanding the underlying infrastructure which you're working with and not just focusing on Kubernetes was also a big cost saver. But right sizing is really tricky for teams. And if you want teams to care about costs, you've got to give them access, whether that's a billing dashboard, whether that's access to the cost explorer, or even building tools like we did, which extract data out of the cost usage reports and moved it into another data store so we could have that data available alongside the metrics which the development teams use for their day-to-day -day dashboards for performance analysis is super important. We did look at recommenders and some tooling to help us better understand the impact of requests and limits on our workloads. But due to the really spiky nature of our traffic, we found them a little bit um, uh, suboptimal. And indeed, reverting back to incremental trial and error and load testing has been the way which has worked for us to optimize those workloads. Now your provider may have an API which can help you uh, get to your cost information. Use that. There's lots of tooling which can help share cost information with the teams, whether they are third party or whether they are open source. There are some great open source tools or whether you build your own. But I would just err on the side of caution that integrating any of those solutions with your workloads is going to be the time consuming bit as we discovered way back when we were uh, tagging up our workloads inside of uh, our cluster back in 2019. So let's have a look at what the impact on costs have been. Initially, in our first year of doing this, we did see a decrease, uh, largely around the awareness work and the initial optimizations done on the cluster for our um, gap reduction. We then introduced dedicated hosts but we didn't start getting the full benefit from that until we'd implemented our custom scheduler and descheduler to manage the workloads across those more efficiently. And then it looks like we flatline, which we kind of do in terms of cost. But it's worth pointing out that it's an ongoing program of optimization and analysis. And although the costs haven't gone up, the amount of workload certainly has. We've had some really big sporting work loads in the recent months and the graph isn't showing that in terms of cost looking at the actual throughput of the workloads on the cluster it certainly does show so show that so although this doesn't really show an increase in workload the cost is staying static and that's down to the great work we've done in terms of optimizing optimizing our network setup and all the other analysis of costs uh, in, in the uh, ec2 and um, Cost Explorer interface. And this is an ongoing thing. It's not going to be finished. We still need to keep at that. And so far, we've reduced it by 33%. But I said it was an unfinished tale because we've still got much more to do. So some closing thoughts. You have seen lots of techniques and things we've learned and things we wish we'd done better and things we wish we'd investigated further throughout this talk. But it is an ongoing process. But I hope what I've shown you in this talk can help you with your Kubernetes cost savings, whether you're running them on AWS or another cloud provider. One important thing we didn't ask ourselves at the beginning, which I'd advise you to do if you were starting out on this journey, is at the beginning, ask yourself not how much you want to save, but how much should your services cost? Having an idea of the value of that service and the risks associated with it and coming up with an actual number means that you've got a better target to aim at. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and goodbye. If you've got any questions for me, contact me through the channels from PlatformCon, uh, but otherwise you can contact me on the socials as well. Thank you very, very much.